Viewing the kitchen as both a culinary and spiritual haven, New Delhi-born chef, Mr. Savir Saran, has nurtured a lifelong passion for the traditional flavors of Indian cooking, leading him to become an accomplished chef, cookbook author, educator, and culinary consultant. Mr. Saran's approachable style has helped him demystify Indian cuisine in America. He's long been regarded as a legend in New York City food circles, having garnered a Michelin star at Devi, a first for Indian cuisine, as well as the first for any non-French or non-Italian restaurant in North America. Speaking, teaching, and appearing at leadership retreats worldwide, Mr. Saran has used food as a bridge to bring disparate groups of people together. His storytelling prowess, his voracious appetite for biographies, political texts, and other historical books, along with his travels around the world, have given him a unique understanding of complex geopolitical challenges. Please put your hands together for our next speaker, Mr. Savir Saran. Good morning. So I'm still searching for who I am, and I thought nothing better to have done as an opener than to sing a line for you that's been humming in my head for the last three or four days. Jinhe khud apna pata nahi hai Main aap apni talash And so I am continuing to search for who I am. The first slide gives you a little idea of who I was when I left for America at the age of 20. I had a smile in my face, which somewhere down the line I, guess I may have lost a little bit of, but I try to keep smiling nonetheless. This is what New Yorkers knew me as as I arrived, went to art school at the School of Visual Arts after having left Sir JJ School of Art in Mumbai. At the art school in Bombay, the artistic part of me died. It died several deaths. The education in our art schools was anything but creative, liberal, and inspiring. So in New York, I arrived to study arts, but the hunger in me to be an artist had somehow gotten lost. So this boy came to New York, but became something else. And Manhattan, with its towering buildings and everything, taught me to dream big, to think big, and to be that young boy that modern school where Sant Vihar in Delhi had made me uh, proudly uh, become. And these towers were tall, but my dreams and ideas were taller still. And the streets, as busy and crowded as they were, they couldn't crowd my headspace in being who I am. So the control all delete moments happened every day, every minute that I lived and breathed. And what I did was I just allowed life to happen. And I decided I'll be one with life rather than fight it. And so these buildings inspired me to keep dreaming bit, but never drop who I was. During that journey in Manhattan, I went from being a student of the arts to becoming a retailer. I worked for the Metropolitan Museum of Art gift stores. Then I became an uh, assistant buyer at Bergdorf Goodman, one of the chicest, fanciest retailers in America. From there, I became the merchandising director for the home collections of Henry Bendel. All of this applied my artistic sensibility, but in a newer way, in making money for somebody else. I woke up in the morning, and to take um, <clears throat> something uh, fresh to the office, I cooked every morning around from 5, 5.30 until 7, 7.30, and I took breakfast or lunch to my employees. And then in the evening, I would come home around 7.38, and by 10 o'clock, I would be hosting dinner parties. These dinner parties ended up having celebrities and average people alike, classmates and strangers, who would come and eat in a student kitchen, in a roommate kitchen, and then in my own apartment in Manhattan. I would feed people that came in. I just cooked. Why did I cook after having had a 12-hour day? It, I was feeding my soul. And in doing that, these strangers would come in, eat meals that word spread were the finest meals being cooked in New York City. And at 25, I became the youngest professor at NYU teaching nutrition and food studies. I taught there till the age of 30. And at 30, I decided to move from NYU to teach at Harvard School of Public Health. Programs with Harvard and Culinary Institute of America called Healthy Kitchens, Healthy Lives. 
and worlds of healthy flavors, where doctors, nutritionists, and chefs came together to teach physicians and the CEOs and executive chefs of corporations how to eat, live, and cook so they could feed people better foods. So that was the journey of my career from being an artist, a student of the arts, to being a teacher. But that was Manhattan. And somewhere along the line, a man came and gave me $2 million and said, open a restaurant. So I was, at the same week, I was applying to Columbia University, got in to study a PhD in a comparative study of Middle Eastern languages and religions. I decided to opt a rest, a close, a, open a restaurant instead. And the restaurant became the first michelin star restaurant that wasn't French or Italian. It also propelled me in the world of chefs. I, you know, chefs who have Michelin stars think they're bigger than the world. And some of them even commit suicide if their star gets taken away. But uh, my journey wasn't about cooking as much as feeding others. So I did this New York uh, restaurant scene, living in New York, being an artist in New York, an artist who supported other artists. But then, just as I was in my peak of my career in New York City, I had a moment that brought me to San Francisco where a billionaire who's Indian came to me and said, Savir, you're doing this incredible food at Devi, why don't we bring it to San Francisco? And I said, oh yes, farm to table, farm fresh, local, all of that would come into play. And so I moved to San Francisco and the reset happened. And from San Francisco, I lived in the uh, tallest apartment building in San Francisco called the Nima building and I had the penthouse apartment. And this was the view that I would uh, be with. And as the restaurant was opening for 19 months, I found myself with nothing to do but to be me. And for 19 months in this beautiful, the balconies, the views were incredible. From around 7.38 in the morning when this incredible city in California would go to sleep, I would come awake. And I would look at City Hall and the buildings and the fog beyond, and I would sing from around 7.38 in the morning till 8 in the morning. And I would sing and feed myself by singing. And I had a Patawa Tanpure ki awaz. I haven't sung in many years. But I would sing to feed me. I would sing to bless the universe, I thought. I had the power to bless all the people that were sleeping. And when the light would come up, I would take two hours of sleep. And then I would wake up and start being me again, the other me. And um, the city was very uh, beautiful. It was where my grandparents lived. I'd been going there from a young age. But San Francisco, with all this richness of beauty and of money and of wealth and the tech business, there were a lot of homeless people, a lot of sad people, a lot of broken people that the city could have helped but was choosing to neglect. And as I paid my attention to them, the city was building my restaurant. And 19 months into it, the city and our landlord, where we were opening a restaurant with 400 seats, were in daggers trying to see if there was space for a restaurant like mine to open, which was giving the tenants, the landlords, $90,000 a month rent, whether it was correct to open that restaurant or should the city have been, um, <clears throat> have given the landlord permission to open a, 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 a cobbler, a dry cleaner's shop, a bodega, a, a dry cleaner. So that's the challenge. The city is getting $90,000 a month from a future owner of a business, and the city is challenging that. The landlord had lied to the city and built a building that was just slightly taller, so the space couldn't have been a, a, a 4,000 square feet and another 6,000 square, uh, square feet restaurant as one. They wanted many different little shops. So as that battle continued, my business partner and I said, if we are giving that much money and these people are fighting us tooth and nail, why should we do why should we do this? And we decided not to do the restaurant. After 19 months of me persevering and being inspired in San Francisco, fast forward, it's been several years, the space we were renting, which is the hottest spot in San Francisco then, still remains empty. Nobody's taken it. The homelessness in San Francisco has risen higher. The fanciful neighborhood they were building without taking care of the citizens of San Francisco that were hurting still remains depressed. Nothing changed. There was some premonition my partner had. He said, when the planet is telling us that you know, all these hurdles are not worth it, you listen to the Control-Alt-Delete moments that happen, and you say, let's carry on. So I left San Francisco, and I <clears throat> went back to my farm. In 2006, my partner Charlie and I had bought a farm in upstate New York, four hours from New York City. I had always wanted to have chickens and uh, animals that I could have a menagerie of and then care for and tend for and be humiliated by. Because animals have no cares about Michelin stars and uh, PhDs and accolades. They just want to live and they let live. So we took this 80 acre farm that people would call one of the be most beautiful spots on the planet. This is in fall. And we had uh, 100 ducks and geese. 
We had over 200 chickens of 38 of different breeds. We had uh, partridges, we had pheasants, we had peacocks, we had alpacas, llama, a partridge and a pear tree. Everything that you could think of was there. And we had an apartment in New York City, a restaurant there, Tapestry. This is winter at the farm. Somewhere on the left you can see American Masala Farms logo in the blue there. And we had barns and, and it, rugged life. These are my alpacas in fall. And this is the farm in spring. This is a crab apple tree. And that yellow building was the guest cottage. The green and the yellow buildings, those are espalier apples. The apples that, are, that grow flat against a, a building's body. This is a farm in the summer. Those are my ducks and geese. So this farm life, while I had my restaurant tapestry where we served food from 19 countries at any given time, the farm was where I didn't come for oxygen, but I came to feed animals, to have a connection to the land. But the people in this rural area of upstate New York were as uh, cruel, as uh, forgotten, as broken, as uh, unfortunate as the people of San Francisco in a city. So when I came here, I came to the chance and the welcome of people that thought the brown man, the uh, uh, gay man, the um, uh, man who spoke with an accent was an intruder taking over their space. They didn't even care that my partner Charlie and I were supporting the lunch, learn, and study program of their school in the summer when kids had no place to go and eat. If we didn't have this program, the kids would go hungry. They didn't care that the winter jackets being given to them were given by people like me and others who had come to the community to be part of a community. But their mindset told them that the other, the foreigner, the uh, Hindu, was the uh, unfortunate and inconvenient um, new member of society. So I told people, for my oxygen, I lived in the city. For my connection to the land, I came to the farm. So what I'm trying to tell you is that these control all delete moments happen every day. That you could be living in Gaga land thinking that this was oxygen if you were unaware of the reality of the other people's lives. When Hillary Clinton was running for presidency, I told everybody she'll lose. And all my friends thought I had a black tongue. And she lost because the, my neighbors, the neighbors who I lived with in this idyllic haven on this planet, were angry. They were lost. They were sad. They were broken. They hated the other. And we, the modern school that I went to had taught us that we are all one. Bikre, bikre, taare hai hain, lekin jhil mil ek hai. That the human collective shimmers and shines when all amongst us are happy, when all amongst us are being cared for. So at the farm, as I tended for animals and tended for my neighbors, my neighbors couldn't accept that another could come and join them. So this was the other uh, moments that would greet me. But then Manhattan would ground me all the time. In 2018, as I was shuffling between New York City, a restaurant and my farm, and the city would seduce me with busy traffic and tall buildings, I suffered a stroke. And I suffered a, a stroke that paralyzed my left side for a few, uh, two days. But then I lost speech, I lost sight, I lost the ability to write. I lost the ability to read. And I'm a man who would write 8 to 12 hours every day. I've penned three books that have sold over a quarter million copies. I'm, my fourth book comes out in March. It's called Instamatic. It's 80 photographs and 80 essays on life and living. So I couldn't do any of that. And I thought I'll die. And the doctors gave me a few uh, weeks to live. I'd lost 50 plus pounds in a, a span of two weeks. So Manhattan, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell my family that I was going through this battle of life and death till the doctor said to me, you need to be in hospice care. And I remember this being the last image I saw of Manhattan as my mother convinced me to come back to India to spend my last bit of time on this world with her in her care. And this was what made me cry for the first time in my life as a grown boy, leaving this land that was my land, the land that was the land of all the people from around the world that come to this land of liberty, New York City. So I got onto the plane with this last image and then I arrived at January 1st, 2019, seeing this as uh, if I was going to meet a friend in Noida from Delhi in the Barapulla. This is Nizamuddin Basti in the colors of that. And this was a view from our home looking up to the sky on that first day of January in 2019. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, plants arriving at my new home in New Delhi as we set home in New Delhi. My restaurant, the House of Celeste in Gurugram, where I've opened a restaurant a couple of weeks ago and the food that we serve there. Life is all about the choices we make. 
It's all about the mindfulness with which we live, breathe, practice what we do, and nurture the relationships we are given. It's not about what you think you're eating, but it's about what you literally are eating. You are what you eat, make good choices, do the right thing by yourselves, don't worry about failure. Failure is the gift that life gives us every moment that we think we are stumbling onto something wrong. Because if you're present, if you're mindful, if you're all together, you'll grab from that moment a lesson that's invaluable and will equip you for life to be better citizens of this world and better citizens of a global village that you want to be part of. And we are disparate and broken into isms. We are nothing but angry people creating an angry world. When we look at each other as human beings of equal merit, worth, and hope and aspirations, we are all one, and we can sing and dance together. So I hope you all have a wonderful lifetime, living to be who you are, not what people want you to be. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was indeed a very inspiring insight into your life. May I now request our Vice Chairperson, Mrs. Radhika Bharatram, and our Director, Manika Ma'am, to facilitate our speaker with a token of appreciation. Thank you, Radhika. <laughs> I thought I'd taken more time. How much time did I take? I don't know. The timer would be right there. It went blind, so I, I was so worried. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir and ma'ams.